Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to the O'Culture Podcast. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. And if you know me, you know I like my art like I like my anything. Forbidden. Hey, it's probably the Scorpio in me. So who better to talk to about some of the ancient forbidden arts than Dr. Al Cummins, who's in the house for the first and hopefully not last time. Dr. Al and I are going to be chatting about some of the forbidden arts as they were known during the Renaissance, a few different forms of divination including geomancy, which Al is gearing up to teach here very soon, more on that after the chat, and also cardamancy, which both fascinates and excites me, probably in an unhealthy, strange sort of way. Of course, Al is a professional diviner and historian, as well as a poet and a consultant of all things magical. His approach to ritual divination and sorcery comes from both a long-term practice and an academic background in the history of early modern magic. And we put that background to the test at the very end of this chat, had a little fun, and if you're a patron, there's something really cool in store for a couple of you here soon. So let's press play on this grimoire on tape and listen to Dr. Al Cummins' Wax Forbidden on all things divinatory. Enjoy! Dr. Al Cummins, thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. No problem, no problem. So uh, that doctor title, uh, you do have a doctorate in the history of English magic. So, you know, pray tell, good doctor, at what point in the journey did you say, yeah, you know, history of English magic, that's what I want this whole thing to be about? Well, I went to university as an undergrad to study history because I was really interested in the English Revolution. You know, we uh, we killed a king after we decided that his despotic behavior had betrayed the very people that he was set to rule over, which was, you know, kind of a big deal at the time because of divine right being taken very seriously. The king's touch was still thought to cure scrofula, the, the king's evil, as it's sometimes called. And uh, there are certainly reports that when he when he was killed, the uh, the mass of people ran forth with handkerchiefs to, to dip into the martyr's blood for various magical purposes. So I was interested primarily in the political aspect of the English Revolution initially, as a, as a you know, an upstart young 17, 18 year old reading a lot of anarchist theory. Uh, but I quickly became more, uh, far more interested in the social history, social, cultural, and I guess intellectual history of the period as well. And when you're looking at that and its context, you can't help but look at the, the magic of it. And of course, I'd also been uh, interested in magic for as long as I, I can remember. And it was certainly not only from a a fascination with mythology and with ritual and tradition and and metaphor and and drama, but also uh, a way to explain, you know, certain uh, events and phenomena that had been occurring to me from a very young age. You know, um, a sleep phenomena, particularly, and also a a sensitivity to um, the spaces in rooms and the feel of old places, <laughs> particularly. Uh, my, my mother and father took me around an awful lot of you know, English heritage sites and things like that. So I'd gone to university to study uh, the history of the revolution, and I'd come to discover that part of this revolution or a part of the, the worldview of these uh, revolutionaries was, was magic. And so to look at the operative ways in which magic was, was useful, how it not just described a, a worldview, but how it elucidated it and how it showed engagement with nature, which again is a big theme in uh, Renaissance studies, uh, the move from a, a medieval mindset to a, the, that Renaissance humanist one, which says that, uh, you know, it's not all set in stone and, and, and God won't get angry if we ask questions about how things work. In fact, maybe we're honoring the divine by using these minds and, and, and fingers and, and tongues that he's given us or she's given us or, or we have been kindly gifted and to treat those gifts uh, with the solemnity they deserve by using them. So I did my undergrad and ended up looking at a group of particular mystical anarchists and the English Revolution who were kind of contemporaries of the levelers 
and the Diggers, about which a lot more has been written. The group I looked at were called the Ranters, uh, and they were a fascinating set of, uh, of folks who uh, believed in, in wildly different things, but considered themselves, uh, quote, in singleness of heart. And they had an awful lot of very interesting uh, sort of Christian mystic anarchism to them. And from there, I realized that astrology was uh, an incredibly important part of political, social, and environmental understandings and context for a pre-modern mindset. And so I ended up doing a master's by research into the, the functions of uh, astrology in 17th century England, so expressly those ecological and environmental ones, how humans relate to nature and time more abstractly, I suppose, as well. Uh, their political functions in terms of the, the civil wars, and then, of course, the, the social factors, if we like, uh, medicine, uh, what we now call counselling. And that was really where I, I started looking in depth at the records of various cunning folk, uh, folk magicians, village witches and wizards. That term, which obviously is, is, is a little contentious uh, for some people. But from there, I realised that this was, I think it was at that point, doing that, dedicating a, you know, my first postgrad, uh, my master's by research to that. But I think I realised that this was uh, my calling. Definitely, yeah. You have a pretty diverse background for sure. Your first book, The Starry Rubric, actually touches on what you were just talking about, the astrology and how that sort of came into, I guess, that same period of English history that you were studying. There is something here that I want to pull on, and that's this anarchist theory that you were talking about. I find that interesting. You use this term Christian mythic anarchism. What what does that mean exactly? How is that different than, I guess, when you would talk about anarchy now? What are the main, I guess, uh, philosophical differences between these, these terms? Well, certainly it's a term that's not, uh, that I didn't cook up that gets applied to this particular uh, sect of radicals, the ranters. And it often connotes some of the easy ways to talk about it are a very definitively explicated form of antinomianism, right? The idea that through the death of the Nazarene upon the cross, the Mosaic law has been revoked and, and many ranters preached that sin had been dismantled quite unilaterally and that it didn't exist anymore and that we were God's perfect children and that uh, thus what we were left with was uh, in the end a form of, of, of fairly rabid anti-formalism that said that, uh, you know, you're already perfect and any priest that tells you that you're in sin is in fact an agent of the devil attempting to bring us back to some retroactive uh, understanding or some uh, regressive understanding of uh, of our souls and our, our, our soul's purpose in the world. So they were very much drawing on uh, Christian sources. They, 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 you know, some of them arguably were mortalists, didn't believe in the immortality of the soul, but they were all concerned with mysticism and spirituality and with what the soul was, even if they, you know, they thought we only got one throw of the dice, so to speak. You know, you are also an expert in uh, divination. I'm curious, at what point did you discover that subject as well and make it part of your own magical practice? Sure. Well, you know, in terms of ritual, in terms of story, in terms of understanding ourselves through the stories we tell and our engagement with myth and things like that, I'd, I'd been interested in, you know, tarot, which was the easily the most sort of uh, culturally available, I suppose, the thing, you know, it's the, it's the, the common sense, the, the Times New Roman of divination systems, so to speak, in, uh, in, in the quote-unquote West. And so I'd been interested in, in, in playing around with that, but I think it wasn't until I was a, a teenager getting involved in, in chaos magic and reading, you know, Phil Hines' Condensed Chaos, I think, is, is probably one of the books that, that kicked it off to actually not just read about magic and think about it from a you know the lens of, of occult philosophy but actually to to practice it and there are many techniques in many you know chaos magic 101 books that i think you can look back and see that they're they're definitely techniques of of, of augury and they might not be based on the idea of the you know the flight of birds or even you know the haruspexy of you know, dissecting the the livers of sacrificed animals but the idea in many Chaos magic books of, of going and reading the city as if it were talking to you, as if it, uh, there were messages there, and as if the messages were useful, that you could engage in, um, you know, a wander around the neighborhood for expressly magical purposes. And, and, and plenty of people uh, wrote uh, on 
concepts uh, from the situationalists about the, the drift or the derive. My, my French accent is terrible, I apologize. Uh, but this idea of, of, of conscientiously meandering, <laughs> so to speak, which uh, I don't know if it, that sounds as oxymoronic as, as, as I just think it does. Uh, but the, the notion of seeking out an answer from the spirit of the world in some way, uh, whether that was glimpsed through a, a stray piece of newspaper on the pavement as you're crossing the road or what you think a, a neon sign says uh, the first time around before you read it properly and realize that it isn't actually talking about the very thing that you were just pondering on. And uh, the idea of actually engaging with one's landscape and with the spirits of it uh, was something that was very, very powerful for me. And that was a huge shot in the arm for me to move from just considering, you know, this is this is a cool thing to do and, 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 and seems to be producing some interesting results to actually uh, helping me firm down and really study hard and, and knuckle down and learn, you know, list of tables of correspondences and things like that uh, in order to better understand and have a wider vocabulary to be able to recognize, apprehend and engage with the kind of spirits and mysteries that I was, you know, starting to explore. Yeah, you had a, hold on, I gotta scroll through my notes here, because I legitimately just copied an entire paragraph that I loved from your Circling Ways in Geomancy blog post uh, from last year, and mm -hmm. I actually want to read it. It's the first paragraph, and I want to read it because I just, I love... I just love the way that you wrote this, so just bear with me for a moment. But this will give, I think, the audience some context of just you and your magical style, maybe, and also the way you write, which I think is awesome. So let me just read this real quick. In the relatively early days of my magical practice, I gathered and used a lot of things I found in the course of going on walks. Bits of interestingly shaped sticks, torn pages of books and newspapers, playing cards, scraps of fabric, that sort of thing. This seems a common enough phrase for many magicians learning to navigate their landscape and sense the subtle tides and shifts around them in those interactions. Walks around my neighborhood, building my relationship with the spirits of place, or drifting through unfamiliar parts of town on extended augury expeditions, these rambles would lead me to find objects that seemed significant and magically useful. There was something so satisfying about finding meaning and use in things picked up off the ground, those discarded omens and overlooked materials of inner city sorcery. For years I kept a stray white cue ball which I had found when on an extended lunary wandering, chalk marked ivory globe uncannily out of place, plucked from the gutter of night a delicate egg of veiled promise. End quote. So that's a wonderful prose, Dr. Al. I just love that. I wanted to share that. It also, in the blog, sets up a story about brown seed beads and how you generally approach geomantic practice. I do want to talk about geomancy at length here, but I want to go back to something mentioned in that paragraph that I just read, playing cards. As part of your consulting business, you offer readings in tarot, which you mentioned, geomancy, which we just mentioned too, and cardomancy. And we've talked plenty of tarot on this show. And as I said, we'll get to the geomancy in a minute. But cardomancing is something that I've always found rather intriguing. This is uh, divination through playing cards. And I I'll tell you why I find this intriguing. I was taught how to play poker as a young young kid by my grandfather, uh, my mom's father, mm -hmm. probably five, six, seven years old. I was learning how to play poker. I have fond memories of it, you know, playing card games with my sister and all my cousins, and we were all very young. So I mention this because I've always loved to play cards because of that. I've always felt sort of connected to playing cards on a different level, I guess, like not just sitting down playing a card game, but there was something about it, the mm -hmm. mechanics of it that sort of drew me in. And side note, I'm actually trying to make poker like a serious hobby now, I'm trying to play some cash games and tournaments and things like that. So if anybody wants to play, give me a shout. But uh, I also may have a gambling <laughs> problem, Dr. Al. That's a whole different thing. But I'm curious how cardomancy works exactly. I assume it's different than tarot because there aren't any archetypes or correspondences in play, unless there are, and I'm not aware of it. Uh, and I guess that's why I'm asking about this, because I've, I've seen people group tarot and playing cards together as the same sort of discipline, but then I've seen others separate them, and I just want to get your take on that. How is it different than tarot, and what does make it different? The term cartomancy is, is a tiny bit unwieldy in terms of just meaning, you know, divination through through bits of card, right? And in theory, you know, where does Lenormand fit into that as well is, is, is a good question. Generally, though, people distinguish tarot from, as you say, cartomancy, which is defined as, 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 as working playing cards specifically. An interesting question in terms of are there archetypes involved? And I think certainly if you're going to read they start to turn up, and especially if you're reading from an animist lens, you know, those court cards, 
you know, that, that Jack of hearts, that King of diamonds, uh, that queen of hearts, right. Whether or not we go specifically along, you know, an Alice in Wonderland depiction of her is going to be uh, almost a, a mask, uh, which different spirits can wear. So certainly from my, in my practice, uh, the court cards absolutely connote spirits, even if that's a spirit that turns up and says, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pointing you at this particular person in your life. There are cartomancers that read the, the court cards as, you know, people surrounding the, the client or the querent, or even themselves, you know, different aspects of themselves. So often there's a way of reading it, which is a way of looking at correspondences, I suppose. I'm very, very fond if if your listeners are people who are interested in cartomancy but don't know a lot about it, I can thoroughly recommend uh, Charles Porterfield's A Deck of Spells, which is a very short uh, but very concise book which combines the, the history of playing cards considered religiously and magically. And then the other half is, is kind of a grimoire of, uh, of at least 52 spells, uh, one for each card. And uh, he point, and he, he's constructed that and, and compiled that through you know, uh, exhaustive study of, of various folk traditions why exactly it is that the ace of spades, for instance, is associated with death. Well, uh, in some practices, when cards stopped being considered uh, a terrible, corrupting influence, uh, which was pretty much exactly the same point that governments realized they could tax them, um, they decided to use the an ace of spades as the card that bore the stamp that excise had been paid on that deck. And so if you were caught forging cards or selling them without a license or without having paid the, the appropriate tax on them. So the, the story goes, uh, you would not only be hanged, but you would have that ace of spades pinned to you. So this, the, the, oh. the associations that start to develop over time are, are just that. They're, they're historical instances of uh, a card being linked to a particular concept. Sometimes they're also uh, somewhat sort of pictographic. So in one way of reading playing cards, and there are many to be clear and, and, and very you know, culturally contingent and emergent from a variety of traditions and time periods and, and peoples and interactions between peoples crucially as well. But there, are, there is one tradition, for instance, uh, where the fours are all associated with a kind of bed, right? Because of the four bed posts and the four angels around the bed by extension, I, I suppose. So, you know, the, the four of hearts being the marriage bed and signifying, you know, joy and, and maybe some, you know, some sexy times but also, you know, uh, intimacy, as opposed to, say, the four of diamonds, which uh, <laughs> Professor Porterfield refers to, uh, or, or, or finds records of it being referred to as the whore's bed, uh, and is a, lot more, is a lot more associated with, you know, sassy moments, uh, for the sake of sassy moments, <laughs> yeah. uh, shall we say. <laughs> so I've seen some people draw, like, the historical current of cardamancy or maybe just playing cards in general back to like dynastic China. Where do we see though, like the divinatory practice of cardamancy first emerging in what we know of about history? Gosh, I mean that's a that's, a, that's an excellent question. We're really asking when when do people start divining, um, arguably, which is a, a, a deeper question about when do we start uh, doing language? When do we start assigning meaning to uh, symbols that get generated, um, you know, the, the origin of, 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 of writing on things. Um, and then Well, the feel free to answer all those questions it. if you want. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, no problem. What else are we going to do? Um, <laughs> no, I, I, well, the, 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 two, um, the two schools when we're talking about uh, writing, which I think are relevant to, to, to this matter that I'm interested in, are two, two kinds of theories about the, the emergence of us moving from tokens to symbols are about uh, an argument between whether or not humans were doing accountancy or divination first. So there are arguments that say that writing develops out of cuneiform and related earlier proto-traditions that were around a token of having paid something or a, an inventory of how many things uh, you had or, or, or your king had or your, your, or your tribe had. And that the, the way we marked how many we had one kind of quantitative uh, approach began to represent the things that they were counting. The other angle is far more qualitative, and it revolves around tortoiseshell divination, the, the, the finding of a variety of relatively sort of approaching prehistoric tortoise shells that were thrown into fires, and the cracks in them were then red, and that these cracks began to 
be associated with particular things if it was shaped a certain way, and that this informed uh, writing, and that this informed like that character means that thing now. And uh, as a diviner, I'm I'm, I'm firmly on team uh, qualitative <laughs> in that case. <laughs> so by the time we're we're making cards, what we're doing is another form of of sortilege, right? How long have we, you know? How long have we been dividing up the cosmos into manageable chunks, right? How long have we been dividing things up into an equivalent of, you know, the twelve zodiacal signs, or even the four elements, or the sixty-four hexagrams of the Yi Ching, or the sixteen figures of geomancy? How long have we been dividing them up so that we can attempt to map every eventuality, right? That we have a a hook to hang anything on that we have we have a place in our in our pigeon holding system which obviously is you know often a derogatory term now and rightly so but how do we approach understanding something how do we approach understanding what we don't yet understand right we do it through the recombination of what we already know to discover what we don't yet know right we we use we look at the the reports of uh, various travelers and explorers finding animals they'd never found before they describe them by saying it's you know it's kind of like a horse but it's got a really long neck and it's got horns and it's spotted like a, like a cat, you know, it, it's got hooves. We, we, we recombine. And I'm really interested in the kind of epistemology of chimeras in that sense, because that also feels something that's very, very key to, to sortilege, to here are all the different, here are, you know, here's door number one, door number two and door number three, that, uh, or, or however many doors you decide to have that, that things can come through. And then we recombine them to discover what we don't yet know. Uh, and that, that fascinates me. I, I think uh, arguably divination says something about the human spirit. Uh, I'm not quite arrogant enough just yet to, to say exactly what that is, but I think it's, uh, it's a thoroughly human endeavor. I would agree with that. I'm not as experienced as you are with it, but I've had some pretty uh, revelatory and insightful experiences with just tarot. I've never done cartomancy or geomancy or, or any other form of it. And I'm curious, though, uh, just to stay with cartomancy for just a moment. What scenarios, I guess, would you use playing cards in instead of, say, tarot cards? Are there specific questions or, like I said, you know, uh, scenarios, I guess, that lend themselves more to divining through playing cards than they do maybe through tarot cards? That's a, yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. I think for me, it often comes down to the, the character or the spirit or spirit of that particular oracle. Uh, for me, Tarot has always felt a little bit like uh, a batty aunt who is you know, incredibly insightful and you know, very psychic, but also occasionally goes off on these, these strange tangents uh, and things, which, you know, if, if, if you're a good reader, will still be useful to you, but has that quality of like slightly more expansive, slightly more you know, long walks on short tangents kinds of things. In contrast, I find uh, playing cards incredibly blunt, um, <laughs> incredibly blunt, almost rude. And so when I am after a question that requires a very firm yes or no, then I find it very useful. I also learned playing cards from talking and studying with various cartomancers who come from more folk magic traditions, who come from uh, traditions of African-American conjure, of hoodoo, things related to, to those kinds of currents. And so I find them very useful for dealing with the kinds of things that those traditions and systems are very well set up to, to do. You know, is this client under crossed conditions, which is also a term that crops up in uh, early modern European Renaissance geomancy, uh, the idea of someone uh, bearing crosses or, or being crossed. Uh, and so the idea of, of, of something needing a firm answer that doesn't need it, you know, explicated to a particular Kabbalistic mystery that needs, uh, what do I do about, you know, my, my, my asshole boss? And it's not that you know, tarot can't do those things, but it approaches them for, from a different lens and with a different character and with different proclivities. And so I found playing cards very good for getting to the nub of something quickly. And, you know, if you want to know why something, tarot is great because it can, it can, it can expand and explicate on that for, for days. But if you just want to know what to do about something, then, uh, then cartomancy is, uh, is, 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 is my preferred modality. And then I find geomancy somewhere in the middle on the one hand, very gnomic, uh, very sort of mysterious with its 16 answers, but then also very particular in how those 16 answers combine with, you know, the 12 houses of the heavens to give you 192 different placements or answers in a, in a quesited scenario, along with the 100 and 
28 different court configurations that you get from a, a geomantic shield. So again, this kind of emergence of complexity from, from the symbols. Yeah, and I think what I need to know the most, Dr. Al, is when to hold them and when to fold them. So I'm going to have to call <laughs> you up the next time I'm on the poker table. <laughs> have you experimented with much gambling magic with that? I haven't, and I just, uh, it's funny you bring that up, man, because I didn't even know there was such a thing until about two weeks ago, I stumbled across that phrase uh, somewhere, mm. and I was like, gambling magic, I didn't read much more about it. What is it exactly? It crops up in a variety of things, it's sometimes glossed as just simply good luck, it's sometimes glossed as various workings for uh, prosperity, but you also find it in you know books of secrets and, and, and working books of, of spells and operations and, and experiments for you know winning a, a, at a game of cards. Uh, or those kinds of things. There are certainly spirits uh, from, from various grimoires associated with, with that kind of thing. One thing that uh, one uh, root worker friend uh, pointed out to me uh, when we were talking about it was just how weird it was, uh, or how weird he found it in, um, in Hoodoo, because a lot of the time you can see there's a doctrine of signatures going on. You know, I use a, a, a plant that is palmate, like, uh, like sinkerfoil, five-fingered grass for mercury work because mercury rules the hands or, you know, those kinds of doctrine of signature morphology things. You know, I, I, I use a, a yellow flower that, that grows around uh, August because it, it has the, the virtues of Leo in it and is, is good for solar work, you know, like, like a St. John's wort, for instance. But he was saying that the, the, a lot of the, the, the weird gambling uh, magic is, is just weird and he doesn't understand how it works, you know, why one should carry a, a bat uh, under one's armpit or why one should take your mojo bag out into an alley and have your, your lady friend urinate on it. Huh. Uh, it get, they, they, they get very strange, and they get very strange. I think some of them, not to sound too overly psychologizing, but I think a lot of them are about psyching out your opponent as well. If you come back reeking of urine uh, and you have to sit at the table for a long time, you're not going to want to be at that table with that person, <laughs> right. arguably. Well, I think if you go to Las Vegas, you'll find a lot of folks urinating in the, the back alleys there for whatever reason. Mm. But that's an interesting uh, approach to gambling. I didn't know much about that until a couple weeks ago. Are there any definitive source text on this that I could seek out if I was interested? Uh, I mean, as a, a grimoire magician and historian, I'm not actually allowed to have favorites. But if I were, you know, I, I, I have based my practice quite heavily on the Grimorium Verum for a number of years now. And there are, there's a, there are spirits in there that will tell you what other people have, uh, what cards they have in their hand around the table. So you, can, you could certainly look into the Grimorium Verum and it, uh, its its predecessor text, the Clavicula Salomonis de Secretis, which has just been published recently by Joseph H. Peterson as the Secrets of Solomon. Well, I'll tell you what, I was looking forward to this chat for a lot of different reasons, but this may be a game changer here, Dr. Al, so thanks for throwing that at me. I, I do appreciate that. <laughs> Every pun intended, right, yeah. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, you know, one of the topics we both wanted to chat about a bit was geomancy, as I said earlier. You are well-versed in all types of divinatory practices, but you're one of the few who I've actually heard talk about geomancy both in theory and from practice and this strikes me as a subject many listeners have probably heard of in passing but might not know a whole lot about and since you're also a historian i, I think it's best to lay the groundwork might be a pun there as well and tell us a bit about <laughs> the historical practice of geomancy so when and where do we see that first emerge on the magical scene well we first see it in the form that we would recognize it now probably from arabic sources and the notion is around the 10th, 11th century, uh, Arabic sources and peoples and diviners uh, and, and, and booksellers and, and various other merchants start spreading out into, on the one hand, Europe, and on the other hand, Africa, particularly West Africa. And what they called uh, Ramel, uh, my accent again, atrocious, um, Al-Ramel or Ibn Ramel sometimes, is, which is generally translated as sand science or the art of cutting sand sometimes, referred to a set of practices around which a diviner would enter into some light trance state and mark a number, make a number of marks in something easily markable like sand, the earth, uh, which you know, bears witness to the heavens. And they wouldn't count these numbers. That's the, the crucial point, because what you would then do is you tally up whether they were odd or even, the, the number of lines you've produced. And this would, you, would, you would do this four times and you would generate a geomantic figure. So if we want to visualize that, 
if uh, listeners are familiar with the hexagrams of the Yi Ching, which some anthropologists and historians of geomancy refer to as a geomantic oracle. We are familiar with the idea of the hexagram being a figure made of six lines of broken or unbroken rows, I guess, of uh, broken or unbroken lines. Geomancy is, the, is, 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 is very similar, European Renaissance geomancy and indeed Arabic Islamic geomancy. But they, there's only four lines for a start, so that, uh, and uh, they, they are single dotted or double dotted rather than, or occasionally a, a dot or a dash. Um, to distinguish, or, or sometimes that single dot's represented with a circle. There are, there are variations because it starts spreading out and it becomes so incredibly popular. But in, in, in short, that means that, owing to the math of things, there are only 16 figures of ways in which you can break down four lines into single and double dots. So you start to generate those, and then they are manipulated in various ways, various sort of low-key uh, mathematic algorithms, um, which are surprisingly difficult to explain uh, over a phone, but are, are very, very easy to show. And there are plenty of YouTube videos of people showing you how to generate geomantic figures and how to set a chart. Lots and lots of them. And the figures are then often fed into a chart, which is usually referred to as a shield. And this is assessed in various ways. One of the most popular becomes to assign the first 12 figures that are generated in a, in a shield chart to the houses of the heavens in various ways. And, as, uh, and geomancy very quickly starts to draw on the language and the grammar of the stars of, of astrology. But crucially, it works it as a kind of sortilage or a kind of, even one might say automatic writing as a way to generate the data. Automatic drawing would be a more accurate way of putting it, automatic marking to generate the data that's used to do a horary chart, a, a snapshot of that particular moment and a snapshot of the underlying answering of a, a query. And so we get people starting to talk about a geomancy via this transmission through, through Arabic sources uh, and of the, the significance of uh, people studying geomancy you know, in, in terms of you know, Arabic philosophers and, uh, you know, uh, of, of natural and occult forms, because obviously those are very often not differentiated uh, at that point. And it spreads out into Europe and uh, it kind of lies there, you know, percolating through a little bit. You get Chaucer making geomantic puns and things like that. But it's not really until uh, a lot of texts are translated into French and certainly, you know, the, the, by the early modern period, uh, geomancy is a relative latecomer that's been kind of percolating about for a bit, but suddenly kind of explodes onto the English scene with the, arguably with the, the publication of, of Christopher Catan's the geomancy, um, which is also a term that gets used to refer to a handbook that teaches geomancy as well as the oracle itself. And uh, this comes out in, gosh, 1597. It's pretty, it's very late, but uh, it, it's an instant, you know, bestseller and, and, and goes through multiple editions and suddenly everyone is, is super interested in this, in this art. And that's not to say that's the first time it appears. That's, that's the height of its kind of, uh, it's the start of the height of its popularity. It's certainly been kicking around longer. Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa refers to it as one of the most accurate divination systems, for instance. So he's, he's very enamored by it, uh, as are many, many other occult philosophers and magicians, the sort of high ceremonial stripe and the more earthy, but uh, cunning folk and, you know, village wise women and wizards. You mentioned several things in there that I had individual questions about, so I do want to touch on some of these things maybe in more detail. But the first thing I want to ask you, man, is you mentioned also Geoffrey Chaucer in that explanation there, and you said he was making geomantic puns. I've only read the Canterbury Tales, and I loved it as a teenager. haven't read it since, I guess. But uh, was he making geomantic puns in those stories as well? Yeah, I believe so. He makes some crack about um, Fortuna Major uh, uh, relating to the rise of the sun. Fortuna Major is a, uh, a figure of, uh, of geomancy. It's a, a solar figure. It often connotes a slow, steady personal success, as opposed to Fortuna Minor, which often represents the little lucks that come and go very quickly and, and easily, uh, the easy come, easy go. And uh, yeah, he refers to uh, the sun rising by these, these kinds of points. Where does he say that? I think... I would have to look that up. I can't remember off the top of my head anymore. I should know those things. <laughs> oh, no, that's totally fine, man. Yeah, I was just curious, you know. So mm -hmm. do you ever look back on things that you experienced as a kid 
or at any point in the past, I guess, of your of your life here, and you realize that like while you may not have known exactly what something meant that you were drawn to it anyways, you know, like that's one of those text the uh, canterbury tales I, I always enjoyed as a youngster you know kind of like shakespeare mm-hmm. like i i enjoyed shakespeare didn't know why but i did and i just didn't know why and then of course you know you grow up and you discover all this the esoteric and occult connections to his writings and all the symbolism and and so on so it's just very interesting you know you throw out chaucer i'm like oh i really enjoyed the canterbury tales i wonder what was occult or esoteric in that text now yeah well again these these things don't exist outside of their outside of their cultures and especially with Shakespeare you know he's he's marvelous not just because he's you know uh, such a great poet and and so interested in you know uh, mashing up uh, old literary tropes to invent new ones but he's also you know uh, and, and and again this is things scholars argue about but he's certainly pretty well partially versed in a variety of occult philosophy you know the the use of uh, talking about you know, various stones and things, or, or various plants. Usually, there's a there's a very particular meaning behind uh, materia that he mentions, and that's not even to start talking about uh, the way that humoral theory, which after all is, you know, a way of embodying the four classical elements in not just the human body, but the human consciousness and the interactions of humans with each other and with nature, and as an expression of nature of a naturally magical cosmos. You know, all these things are going on there. You know, we all build off the the, the latent magic of our, of our, of our cultures, and, and one of those ways, especially, I think, is through through poetry uh, and through through literature. Yeah, things just get curiouser and curiouser for me, and I, I'm sure you feel the same way or have felt the same way. So, you know, back to the geomancy. You know, you mentioned the figures, and it's made up of 16 figures, and I'm not going to name them all, but things like the gain, the loss, the joy, the sorrow, greater fortune, lesser fortune, and so on. Yeah. And you mentioned in one of your blog posts about it that this simple vocabulary, these these figures, the way that they're named, but from that comes a complex and highly nuanced system of contextualized divination, one that many modern magicians know about, but many might like to know further. And I'd like to know further about what these figures sort of embody or represent. I mean, it seems like it's pretty straightforward in the way that they're named, but I'm curious, you know, are these what we would call archetypes or correspondences, or are these unique to geomancy? Well, they draw heavily from from astrology. You know, geomancy is called the, the sister of astrology, and at least one practicing geomancer as well as academic anthropologist, Van Binsbergen, certainly argues that probably they are containers for uh, astrological concepts before they exist independently. Uh, and some, it depends, some geomancers are, are very much of the attitude that, you know, while we might be able to correspond, say, the geomantic figure of Laetitia of joy to Jupiter or to Pisces, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that it's actually anything to do with that and it should exist on its own. The planetary associations with the figures are pretty standard, uh, pretty set, uh, whereas the zodiacal associations or, or correspondences, if we want to call them that, vary considerably more. And it seems that many professional geomancers, both historically and, and today, uh, tend to get a little bit idiosyncratic about, you know, well, I found that this figure corresponds better to this zodiacal sign, uh, for instance, or even that the figures themselves, the 16 figures, are uh, like the 12, the 12 signs of the zodiac and their elemental triplicities assigned to elements in a kind of elemental quartet, if you like. And they also they also vary from geomancer to geomancer. Some people think that that Laetitia figure is a is a watery figure. Some people think of it as primarily a a, a fiery figure as well. And so there are uh, a number of ways of approaching it, but as to what they are, that's a really interesting question, and it's one that, again, our uh, our dear weird uncle uh, Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa ends up pondering on as well. And he has something very interesting to say about it, which is that he 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 points out that symbols, if we can use that word, can be understood pictographically that they they represent something, and that this is the realm of image magic or, or, the, or the, the representative image magic that we're familiar with. You know, you draw an image of a tiger on your shield to have the strength of a tiger and to, and to you know, elicit the fear of seeing a tiger in your, in your enemies. 
But he also says that you can have uh, glyphs, we might say, magical markings that are ideographic, that represent, uh, that don't necessarily represent, but simply are an instantiation of that thing, that they have some essential quality of it. If we think about occult philosophy of name, for instance, that's a, a, a comparative thing that, uh, or vocus magicae or barbarous words, there are some words that just have power, and it's not because they can be translated into meaning something particularly. It's not that they are a signpost to something else, some arbitrary marking that mean, that we decide means, it means this thing through epistemological or, or cultural or social or intellectual you know, boundaries and, and, and agreement. We're talking about, again, the, the philosophy of language, I guess. But that they uh, they represent some fundamental aspect of the thing that they are that they are speaking the name of, right? When you when you when you carve the name of a of an angel into a talisman, you know, the, 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 there are definitely occult philosophies that say you are you are using that name like a handle. It, it is it is part of that being, and it's part of how you apprehend it, and it's it, it's what makes it more likely to turn up, right? And so Agrippa says about the the uh, the, the, the geomantic figures that they are kind of both of these things. They're kind of both pictographic and ideographic. So I keep talking about joy, which I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to bring joy into the world. The figure of joy, if we can conceive of it uh, as, as four uh, rows, is a single dot, and then three double dots. Uh, it looks like an arch, and it's said to represent the wedding arch, amongst other things. Uh, again, the idea of the, the happiest day of your life, right? And... As such, that's, an, that's a pictographic reading of the, of the, the symbol, the figure of uh, conjunctio, a mercurial figure of combination, of coming together, of meeting, of the handshake, of the deal, of the crossroads, is uh, to, you know, going from top to bottom, two dots, one dot, one dot, two dots. It, it looks like an X, the X that marks the spot, the X that signs the contract that you can't read. Right? And so it represents all those things. Those are ways of looking at it ideographically, uh, uh, pictographically, but it also has these ideographic essentialist qualities to them that we might consider archetypal for, for whatever we end up you know, having to pick that, unpack that term itself apart. So he says, Agrippa says of the geomantic figures that they are betwixt images and characters, right? that, they're, that they're doing both. And this is one of the especially fascinating and powerful things that I find about geomantic divination and geomantic magic as well, of actually uh, rearranging these, these figures to manipulate change in, in oneself and in, in the cosmos and as part of the cosmos. Okay, so that is Agrippa's definition or interpretation, I guess. Does your own personal experience then sort of, I guess, does it, does it validate what, what you've read about him or from him? Uh, sure, I think that's a really useful perspective. I think that's a, a very, very useful perspective that they, they, you know, you can you can consider them as whatever one might define as an archetype or describe as an archetype. For sure, they're also storehouses of, of spirits. They're also and they and they they closely relate, and in some systems are ruled by planetary spirits. So there's there's definitely spirit work aspects to them, both in terms of spirits that present themselves and say, I am the spirit of. Latest year or conjunctio. More commonly, I am a spirit of this thing, and I represent this aspect of this sixteenth of the cosmos. So you mentioned the connection with astrology. There are quite a few, like you said, they're sort of uh, sisters to each other. And mm -hmm. you mentioned that the geomantic chart is known as the shield, and the chart is something that terminology is also used in astrology. How different are the charts in astrology and geomancy? You know, in astrology, I'm thinking more of like a natal chart. That's not what we're talking about with geomancy. So what, what is the shield exactly? Like, how, does, how do you create it? And then how is it best, I guess, interpreted and used? In astrological terms, you know, you have a number of different kinds of charts you can cast. You can cast a nativity chart, which is said to be the, you know, the birth of a person. Uh, it's the one we're probably most familiar with. Then you have horary charts, which are a snapshot of the heavens at the time a question is asked. And the actual underlying occult philosophy of that is, is, gets pretty weird, because why would asking a question at that time, why would that particular time be useful to analyze for, for the answer to it? And it's, it's to do with all sorts of ideas of the, the cosmos narrating itself to itself, and that it kind of, in a way, requires uh, an intelligent organic cosmos for it, to, for it to work. And again, astrologers of all sorts of, of varieties have, have been you know, um, debating this and, and, and turning this over for a very, very long time. So I, I more want to 
present that argument rather than like weigh in on a particular side or, or what have you. But the reason some people give, which is a pretty snappy one for why a horror chart, what horror chart is doing, is that it is a nativity chart for the birth of the mind rather than the birth of the body. You are birthing a new understanding of something. And which is, you know, after all, what we're trying to do with divination a lot of the time, we're trying to to conjure forth what we didn't know before and we do know now, like new information, new knowledge, new understanding. And so the idea is that the the, the first step of that birth is asking the question, um, which is, you know, I, I, I kind of like that perspective. Uh, there are other kinds of astrological charts as well. Uh, decumbitures uh, are done for uh, a sickness when someone becomes ill. So you, it is the, the nativity chart of the birth of an illness or a malady or a misfortune, uh, we might say in the broadest term. And so when we come to geomancy, uh, geomancy is all horary, uh, is all about ask, is all about birthing the, the answer to something and being very earthy. You know, it often has these symbols of, of pulling up treasures from the depths of the unknown, right? The mining metaphors and, and analogies and, and things. So, there are two main forms of geomantic charts, one of which is referred to as the shield. And it's, it's shield-like because it's kind of that uh, downward pointing triangle uh, because in, in tarot terms, a shield chart has 15 places, just like uh, the Celtic cross, for instance, as a tarot spread, has, has 10 places uh, traditionally. But the way they are arranged, again, a lot easier to, to see than to, to, to explain over uh, over an, an audio medium, is, uh, is is in this downward pointing triangle. You are synthesizing down from many figures at the top to a single figure at the bottom, which is referred to as the judge, uh, which is the you know the, the the final judgment on your uh, on your question. And so there is this process of, of distilling down these figures in a in a, in, a, in a very kind of literal way. The figures are smushed together to produce new syntheses. It's a very dialectical process of adding you know these 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 single and double dots to each other to produce a new figure that's a synthesis of, of two figures from whether or not the, the combination of them is odd or of the, those two parent figures are odd or even. And so one of the ways is a shield chart, but they are also sometimes drawn up as a house chart, as it gets called. And that's because of the 15 places in a geomantic shield chart, you will have the first 12 assigned in a variety of ways, um, but most you know, most simply that the first uh, figure, the first, the, the figure in the first place is assigned to the first house of the heavens or is, or is considered to be answering that field of life. The, the 12 houses of the heavens, of course, referring to, you know, your, your life or yourself, uh, your money or your substances, uh, your, your third house being your, your, your siblings, uh, fourth being your land, uh, etc. So they're ways of dividing up the facets of one situation, we might say. And they can be arranged in a square, which is the, the traditional uh, early modern way of charting the heavens. And what you would do is you would put the geomantic figures around that. So it looks a lot more like uh, an early modern astrological chart. And then you would put the, the final judge and the two figures that generate the judge, the, again, distilled down the, the witnesses in the middle of that chart. Again, far easier to to show a picture than to, to try and explain. Yeah, and you mentioned the uh, 12 houses of heaven there. I think that's worth explaining a bit more because that that is similar astrological terminology there, but it's also quite oh, yeah, different yeah. In, how it's, in how it's actually described, I guess. So could you take us through what that means? Sure. They are divisions of the visible and crucially the invisible uh, sky, the sky above us and the, um, arguably the, 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 the sky beneath us um, or in older terms, the, the underworld. And they are divisions of the areas of the sky that the stars uh, move through, that the, 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 the stars wander through, and that the band of the zodiacal constellations moves through as it, as it rotates. So they are, they are the facets of life that the stars or planets or, or, or geomantic figures are representing. So... The seventh house, which you know, uh, fans of the musical Hair might be familiar with as uh, a rousing song, refers to partnerships, uh, most typically romantic ones, marriage, but also can refer to business partnerships, 
It can also refer to the partnership of conflict when you are, you can refer to a nemesis, uh, for instance, a known rival. And so the stars or the figures that might uh, crop up in the seventh house uh, when you are, say, asking about something related to your husband or your uh, business partner or your, your, your rival uh, is going to represent them in some way. So with geomancy, for instance, if that figure is, is the figure of, uh, is a martial figure, for instance, the figure of the boy or the warrior, Pua, then you know, some readers read that as suggesting that your, that your enemy, if that's the question it is, is, is feisty, is, um, is, is, is ready for war, but is not really well prepared. The, the kid that's, that's got up too quickly and got too excited and hopped up full of sugar, and so they're fractious but don't have any stamina. Uh, depending on how the question is phrased, crucially, that figure in that, in that house, uh, which you can think of as a, as, as a placement, that's the, the term for a, a figure in a house, uh, in, a, in, a, in a place on the, on the chart, can refer to you or the person you're asking about. And that's why it's very important to be very specific about who you're talking about, who the chart is about, right? If you're asking about does the, does the good fortune or the bad fortune uh, of, of a figure in a place refer to you or, or the person you're talking about? if it's a question about an enemy, for instance. And so here, specificity becomes very, very important when we're setting questions. Geomancy is kind of a little bit infamous for, for having very particular yes and no answers, as, as well as qualifying them. Uh, but the, those, that specificity and that, that certainty uh, can only emerge from, from very, very firm foundations of, of knowing exactly what it is you're asking. And so one of the advantages of using a, a house system the, the 12 houses of the heavens is that they allow us to generate an awful lot of different answers and, and nuance from, as I say, 16 figures. When we're used to reading 78 tarot cards, that first 16 figures can seem, you know, a little too basic, right? How, how could you possibly get at the complexity of life and human interaction by these? Well, because any of the 12 houses can have any of the figures in. And crucially, Another thing that distinguishes geomancy from astrology is that the same figure can crop up, and, and from, from cartomancy, is that the same figure can crop up in different, in different areas and in different places in a reading on a chart. Right? So whereas, you know, thankfully, the tower can only come up once uh, when, it's on the, when it's on the table, you could keep getting the, the scorpionic figure of Rubius cropping up all over the chart, which is also a, a martial figure of danger and of cataclysm. That's an example of how geomancy can have more bad news, I suppose. But equally, it could also have joy or, or the greater fortune cropping up in multiple places. And crucially, that also gives you a way of understanding how one facet of your life might be, or a common a root issue might be manifesting in different facets of your life or situation. So similar to the cartomancy question earlier, what are some of the best types of questions to ask during a geomantic reading? Specific ones, <laughs> I guess, uh, would be would be would be my, my my main answer. I mean, it as someone very very passionate about geomancy, I do feel that it has things to offer about you know pretty much anything. But the the types of question in terms of like how to phrase them, yeah, being very very specific is is very helpful. So you have several different ways of pulling out useful information from a, a geomantic chart once you've once you've set it. You have the, the final distillation. There are 15 places. The first 12 are assigned to the Houses of the Heavens. The last three are referred to as the court because they're made up of two witnesses and a judge. We have a, a symbol a set to work with. We have a theme here, a judicial theme. And one of the ways of reading, would, the simplest way is to look at the judge. And if the judge is, you know, if you're asking like, will I get a raise at work? And you want to phrase that more specifically, but that kind of question, and say the figure of gain, uh, acquisitio, a, a Jupiterian figure of, of Jupiter's, you know, bounty and, and generosity and, uh, you know, panoply, turns up as the judge, then yes, the answer is probably going to be, then, then that's, a, that's, a, that's a firm yes. If, however, that, or, or what you then have is, is the two witnesses, which tell a story about how that comes to pass. And those three figures of the court can be read in a variety of ways, but some of them can be read like, say, doing a, a simple three-card uh, tarot spread as well. They can, they can be used as a past, present, future. They can be read as a thesis, antithesis, synthesis as well, uh, which is why I said there was a, you know, a dialectic element to reading them. But you can also look to the particular house that your question concerns, and that's referred to as the quesited house. If I'm asking about, if I'm asking about my career, that's considered a 10th house matter. 
And so I would look to the figure in the 10th house, which would give me further information about the success or the, the failure of this promotion, for instance, if I'm going for, uh, if I'm asking about a promotion uh, at my, my, my work that I do, you know, to, to pay the rent, but actually my sort of, you know, career, uh, the thing I want to you know, get good at in, in, in one's life. So there are a, a number of, of, of points. And then there are other things that you can start pulling out, how, they, how the, the figures in the chart relate to each other and uh, concepts like the index of the chart and the part of fortune, which can be calculated by doing mathsy things uh, with, the, with the, the figures and can crop up. Uh, and, and, and they're really interesting because they can, they can highlight other houses and other placements and other figures that you might not think were relevant to the, to the reading. Uh, you don't necessarily have to read every one of the 15 figures that turns up in a chart. You know, they might not all be relevant to your question. But sometimes the reason for, for you generating them anyway is that it turns out that you were, you know, you were looking in the, in the tent house for help about your career. But actually what it tells you is that you should, you know, part of fortune crops up in the third house, the house of, of brothers and sisters. Uh, amongst other things, and that maybe what's going to help you uh, get that promotion is talking to your your lawyer sister or something who might have some advice about something that's useful. Right? It's a way of again framing not just how do we find out what we don't yet know, but how do we best proceed with something, and and what do we look to in our lives that we may or may not expect to be the source of that help. I'm very interested in divination, not simply sketching out what your deal is, <laughs> right? Like throwing down that that power uh, of the power and the, uh, and the devil and things, and then being like, well, you know, that looks rubbish. Good luck with that. But actually using divination to work out what to do about these bad situations and also how to secure blessings. You know, if it says like this, things look really, really great. You know, I want to know how to, how to keep doing that thing. That's good. Right. And so I find in my own uh, professional practice that geomancy often offers some very practical, magical, remediation, assistance, securement, and uh, ways of navigating potential dangers and pitfalls. And I'm, I'd, yeah, I'd be delighted to talk more about that. Please do if you want to. Go ahead. Sure. Well, you know, these things can range. So let's say you uh, have a client who is asking about, you know, how to, how to navigate a difficult relationship with their brother. You know, say they've, there's been some massive falling out and they want to work out, you know, what's going on with that and how to, how to deal with it. The reading might come up and say, you know, it's, it's a lost cause, your brother's going off the rails, and you might either want to do something about, I, I want to protect them, I want to make sure that they, you know, they don't uh, go off the rails with say, a drinking problem or something, or, you know, I want to, you know, if, that, if, that, if, it, if it's suggested that that, you know, that, that, that sibling might, uh, I don't know, pose some kind of danger. This is vastly becoming a, a really sinister uh, hypothetical situation here. Um, uh, likewise, the reading might say like, no, 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 you just need to apologize. And, you know, uh, you need to recognize that, that that was a very sensitive issue for them. And so it might recommend a, a course of, you know, what we might call quote unquote non-magical approaches or solutions to, 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 to resolving a situation. Equally then, you know, that might mean that you have a range of magical solutions to help with that a variety of approaches to reconciliation work. And one of the things about geomancy being so very elemental is that it provides a whole bunch of modalities of what to do about that thing. If a watery figure crops up as one of the answers in, 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 your, in your reading, you know, I, I often will suggest that the client take a spiritual bath based off the identity of that figure and the, and the spirits around them. So, gosh, uh, Laetitia, uh, which I consider a watery uh, figure, the figure of joy, you know, when that crops up, it can often be a solution to sadness, grief, depression, sorrows of various sorts. And so, you know, I, I will often suggest the client take a, a, a Laetitia bath and, and that will typically involve herbs of, of joy in, in various ways. And the, the way in which I engage with that is through, you know, a study of humoral theory. Again, that, that notion of the, of the elements uh, in the world and in, in the body and in the, the soul and the mind and in our interactions with people. So using a lot of phlegmatic uh, ingredients would be the, the humor associated with elemental water. And so that might take a particular way of approaching both rebalancing the patient, 
if they, you know, they don't have enough of their of watery humors in them, they have too much melancholy, too much earthy humor, then you can rebalance that, you can write it with uh, ennobling earthy energies as well. And so you have the, you know, the classic cure by contrary and cure by governance or ennobling. Uh, you know, if a person is, is running too hot, if they're getting too angry in situations, then again, being cooled down is very useful. Or being sweetened, right, by the, the, the sanguine humor can also be very, very useful. And so there are, there are always going to be a, a number of different ways that you can try and solve a, a problem magically. And so doing divination on working out what the best magical solution is at this point in this moment for this person is a way of providing bespoke uh, consultancy on, on how they design, enact, and, uh, and integrate their, their rituals and their ritual actions. And in, in, in that sense of ritual action, I don't distinguish between, you know, what you do in the weekend in your temple room and who you are on Monday morning or, you know, Thursday night or whenever. We are hopefully always doing our, our magics and, uh, and as such, I think it's, it's important that we understand that we're moving through a, a variety of options and modalities at the crossroads at every breath. And so when we're, when we're doing that kind of thing, divination becomes absolutely crucial to help us, help us steer through, through life's big waves and, and still waters. Wow, man, that was a great answer. Thanks for uh, taking us through that for sure. You also mentioned in one of your blogs that there are some philosophical dimensions to geomancy as well. What did you mean by that exactly? You know, we, we think about philosophy as thinking about thinking. I know that a number of philosophers are already like rolling their eyes at that. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a useful way of framing. These are 16 different modalities of consciousness, as well as 16 different flavors of things that happen in the world, right? They are ways in which we can be, again, I, I mean, I guess that's the philosophical dimension of it. The, the thing I was just saying about, you know, this isn't just what happens you know, on a, on a reading table or on an altar. This is the, you know, turning our whole lives into a, an altar and being valent to seeing the, the symbols and the, and, the, and the speech and the dialogues around us that we can participate in and pirouette around and, uh, and you know, stick our fingers in our ears against or, or, or shout down or, or agree with or, or laugh about. And, and, you know, I guess we return to that notion of, of, of the augury of the everyday, that being in dialogue with, with the world is a, is a very important thing. Uh, I think especially perhaps for modern magicians, which, where it can be very easy to get into magic as a, as a kind of escapism from the world, which admittedly is, is often, you know, not perhaps being run in a manner that seems helpful for the continuation of our species or other species on the planet. Uh, and so to, uh, for uh, those of us raised in the quote-unquote cultural West, uh, where magic is, you know, not considered a, a serious endeavor or, you know, even a, a real thing, uh, that this can feel like a, a kind of uh, a, a return to, it can feel, you know, a nostalgic return to a, a golden age when, when the mind and the soul mattered. Uh, but really, I think magic should be an engagement with the world and the sorceries that we do and the divination we do should help us appreciate the polyvalent, meaning and uh, majesty of, of, the, of the world and our, our chance to engage with it and, and should give us more tools to be more responsible, not more excuses to, uh, to hide away from things. You know, geomancy has philosophical uh, implications. I think that was the, the, the phrase you used. But yeah, absolutely. It, you know, it helps us think about the world and ourselves uh, and each other and explore those things and, you know, helps us uh, if, we, if, we, if we take an etymological approach, uh, you know, to to be a lover of wisdom, uh, of, of the, the philosophia, then, yeah, to, to, to love the practice of consulting an oracle is to, you know, is to, to love the process of how we come to know things and how we come to be creative as well. You know, how we come to know the new things that we are attempting to create. And I don't think it's unique to, to geomancy. I think any divination system, you know, any, any diviner should be having a, a very intimate relationship with what is called wisdom. Yeah, and I think you already answered this, but do you find geomancy to be more informative or accurate than, you know, say tarot or cardomancy or any other forms of divination? More informative or more accurate, I guess? Sure. I find it helpful because um, a lot of my... Magical practices based around elemental work through, you know, my, my doctorate um, research was heavily about magical approaches to 
the passions uh, to what we would now say is emotions, which becomes a term meaning what we mean by it around 1750, although the word itself confusingly is, is used prior to that. It refers to the most emotions of the soul, uh, the movement of the soul. So I'm, I'm very interested in where like mind and body and self and other kind of relate to each other and, and, and jam away. So for me, the elemental basis of geomancy is very helpful and its planetary basis is very helpful as well. I, I, I work a lot in, in, in planetary magic. And so for me, provides... The, the, the quickest means of getting at, oh, we're talking about this set of mysteries. We're talking about this kind of modality. We're talking about this kind of behavior, this kind of person, this kind of place, this kind of action. Uh, and so it speaks, it, it, its language is closer to, its dialect is closer to the one I'm, I'm familiar with and that I find the most useful and inspiring. Um, so it's my preferred form of divination for most things. It's not, uh, you know, like, like tarot, I don't think it's always necessary to to do a full shield on something that just needs like a quick answer, then uh, I'm more likely to use playing cards. And if I want, and if you know, if I or a client really wants to, you know, get in depth with the whys and, and the and the, the meanings and the, the significances and the mysticism of something, then then tarot is great for that. You know, I spent many many years engaged in uh, hermetic Kabbalah, and so like I, you know, that's still in there, <laughs> and that's still really useful for considering the divine and things but if you are going to you know get a job or patch things up with your with your boyfriend or your that the brother from that previous example then uh you know sometimes a, a more practical grounded approach is useful and i find that with geomancy yeah you know al i just have one final question for you and it is it's a bit of a trivia question and uh, I just want to set it up real quick for the audience here. So I do a monthly giveaway on Patreon. And uh, typically I give away books by some of the guests here. In August, I gave away a documentary that we had talked about on the show. And, you know, Al, in honor of your first appearance here, what I'd like to do is give away something to the audience that you're good at. And that is, I'm thinking it's either a cardamancy reading a geomancy reading, or both. And mm -hmm. I think how I want to phrase this is, I'm going to ask you a question. It's a bit of a magic history question. It has to do with divination. And if you mm -hmm. get it right, I will give away both a cardamancy and a geomancy reading to one of our patrons here. If you don't get it right, I'm still going to give away one of the two. So I guess okay. it's, if, right. you get it, if you get it right two readings. If you don't get it right, that's cool. We're still going to have fun. We're still going to give away a reading of choice to the patron. So a lot to writing on this, Al, for you and for the audience yeah, here. Yeah. So let's test your divinatory knowledge. So geomancy in Renaissance magic is considered one of the seven forbidden arts. Can you name the other six? The other six? Gosh, uh, that very much depends on how you're how you're defining them, but certainly they include uh, things like uh, that, that are classed as, as necromantic, right? So some people do a schema by the the four elements, so geomancy, along with pyromancy, aromancy, and hydromancy. Uh, image magic is sometimes qualified as one of those seven, but I think you are after oh chiromancy and um, oh the other one, uh, uh, shoulder bone, uh, scapulomancy. Yes, there you go. So what that means is that when I announce the winner of this month's giveaway, they're going to get a cardomancy and a geomancy reading from you at their leisure, of course. But that will be completely oh, sure, yeah. free to them. I'm actually glad that you got it right. I like doing that for people. And I think that, <laughs> that uh, <laughs> that's why I was like, oh, I'll give away one if you get it wrong. But I'm glad that I could do yeah, yeah. Uh, both here for the audience. So... So uh, we'll have to arrange those details off air later with uh, whoever wins that. So either way, I'm sure that uh, we can take care of that, definitely. So uh, before we go here then, Al, please do tell people where they can find more of you and your work if they're interested. Oh, sure. So uh, I have my website, which is alexandercummins, one word, dot com. That has my bloggery at the end of it, which I, I called the section End Notes, because I thought that was a, a funny riff on talking about necromancy. A couple of people have pointed out that it sounds like there's actually going to be footnotes to the website, which I'm not mad about. 
Um, <laughs> so there's that website, and that also that has my, my blogs. That also has uh, class bundles, which are downloadable classes that you can uh, that you can purchase. That have usually about a two hour illustrated lecture recording by myself, and then a number of the primary sources. So you know, I, I, I talk about you know, a gripper a fair amount in, in, in what I teach. And so I have, you know, full scans of the, uh, the JF uh, 17th century uh, translation of, of, of the three books of occult philosophy and, uh, and the fourth book and things like that, because I think if you're going to, to reference these texts, it's really great if people can actually look that stuff up for themselves and they can see the context that it came in. And then obviously these, these class bundles also contain a, a bunch of recommended further reading and things like that. So they can find uh, downloadable classes there. They can find things uh, like these uh, interviews that I enjoy doing so much, uh, free recordings and, and material on there. And they can also book consultations uh, through that site as well, uh, both readings and I do a bunch of consultation work for artists and, uh, and ritualists on, on, on you know, strategizing their their practices and their and their cycles of, of ritual and things like that. Uh, I also have a podcast that I do with my dear, dear friend, Jesse Hathaway Diaz, which is uh, called Radio Free Golgotha, uh, which we are, we, we have a great time doing a kind of Sesame Street approach to magic where we will pick, you know, this episode brought to you by uh, this particular saint and this particular herb and this particular geomantic figure. And, uh, and this particular kind of magic and this particular dead magician. And then we'll try and like wind our way through those topics and see how they relate or don't relate to each other. Uh, you can also find more of the, the, the primary source materials that I've made available on, um, on my Tumblr, because I'm, I'm cool like that, uh, which is grimoiresontape.tumblr.com. <laughs> and uh, I'm also on, on, on the gram, on Instagram, as, as Grimoires on Tape as well, uh, if you want to see pictures of my workings and... Uh, and keep in touch that way. And uh, I also have a mailing list, which you can get to from my, my website if you want updates on the appearances and, uh, and, and courses and things that I teach, often through uh, Jesse's uh, store, Wolf and Goat, which if uh, some of your listeners aren't familiar with that, I can thoroughly recommend for um, amazing uh, magical materia and things of that nature. And uh, I have some upcoming classes and things that I'm teaching via webinar um, with them. I'm doing a Geomancy Foundation course, which I've been doing for... Uh, a year or two now, which is eight solid hours of training uh, on, on, on geomancy via, via webinar and via illustrated lectures and recordings and things. Uh, and the next cycle of that starts in October and other classes and things of that nature. Yeah, and I laughed during uh, your Tumblr plug there. So it's uh, grimoiresontape.tumblr.com. I know you're cool like that. It, that yeah. had me cracking up a little bit. So. <laughs> Sorry for interrupting that. Yeah. Uh, but anyways, so Dr. No, no, Al no, Cummins, no. I do appreciate your time, and I look forward to speaking to you again soon. I know I pitched you an, an email on a, on a second chat, and I got plenty more to talk about with your other work that we didn't even touch on here. So if you're interested in coming back for maybe a nice wintry chat about the Magi and necromancy, I'd love to do it. Oh, heck yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'll try and stop me. That would be great. Thank you. <laughs> All right, man. Well, Dr. Al Cummins, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate you hanging out, and I'll talk to you soon. All right, you take care, Ryan. Thank you. And there you have it. My thanks again to Dr. Al Cummins. He's what I call a reservoir dog, just a repository of practical and magical information. And hey, if you're interested in geomancy and learning the basics from one of the best, Al has a course starting Thursday night, October 4th, through Wolf and Goat. The link is in the show notes. The course is 100 bucks for four live two-hour classes with Al that run from 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern Time each Thursday here in October. And I'm guessing it's probably worth the money considering the amount of knowledge and microphones dropped here by Al during this chat. And he dropped even more in the Patreon extension as well where Al and I discussed St. Raphael the Archangel and working with him for matters of health and healing, both physical and psychological which led into a discussion about the physical, psychological, and spiritual nature of magic itself. We also talked a bit about the cut-up technique made popular by Brian Geisen and William Burroughs and how that relates to occult philosophy and magical practice. And then Al drops some wicked knowledge about the magic of scissors. That right there, worth two bucks a month, believe me. And a shout-out to some new patrons who hopefully enjoyed that extension. Thanks to Sarah K, Matt, Sarah N., Kat, Charles, and Janet for signing up to support the Patreon recently. And a huge thank you 
to Michael in Jamaica, who became the newest official executive producers of the show. Much appreciated, you guys. And you too can help support the message of infinite love, truth, and awareness by contributing as little as two bucks a month. Each dollar donated gets me one step closer to leaving that dreadful day job behind and freeing myself to bring you even more content like the Patreon exclusive trap or treat feature that's going on right now with each new episode that's posted. And if you can't support monetarily, I get it. Drop a review on iTunes or share the show on social media. However you can support it is much appreciated. But anyway, I got a lot more trapping and a lot more treating to do, so I gotta get out of here. So until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly, reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Please rewind this cassette.